guys, today I will be doing my Lord of Shadows book talk. That was a horrible introduction, and I just coughed up a little bit when I said the word horrible. But I, I really, I really want to get like straight onto the, the spoilers of this book. So here's just like a little clip of the moment that I finished the book. I just finished Lord of Shadows. I don't know. I wanted to get like a like a live action heartbreak, I guess. And now I'm rambling because I'm broken. Five out of five stars, and I can't, like, <laughs> talk about it because it's not the spoiler part of the video, but I, I'm just, mm, there's really nothing I can say. I don't know. I just, I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is. I should go to sleep. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I can't form words. <laughs> All right, so from that clip, um, I don't really know what you can gather from that other than a delirious late night ramblings, but basically five out of five stars. I really feel like this book was a setup for the next book. It didn't fall into the second book slump whatsoever, but I really feel like it was more of a setup for the next book than like a storyline in itself, per se. I did do a Lady Midnight book talk last year, which I'm really excited about because this is the first series that I've ever, like, read as it comes out and uploaded videos as it goes, so I don't know, it kind of, like, has a special place in my heart. But if you want to watch it, I'll link it somewhere. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I don't really know what else to say other than that I'm going to go ahead and get on into the spoilers. So if you have not read it, go ahead, read it, come back, join the party. So. I sped through this book. I have not, I don't have any notes whatsoever. So once again, this is going to be like my Court of Wings and Ruin video. It's just going to be ramblings and all over the place. I liked that Emma felt lost after not really having a direction of where to go because she had been motivated by finding out who her parents' killers were for the past five, six years. And so after kind of figuring out how that all played out, she was like, I don't really know what to do with myself anymore. And I really liked that because it felt very genuine. It felt like what was would really happen if this situation were to occur. The first thing that I really remember is Gwen coming and saying that Kieran was going to be murdered for, for killing Ireleth, for uh, whipping Emma and like conspiring with Malcolm. And then Gwen came to Mark and was like, hey, you need to save this dude. And Mark was like, oh, I don't love him anymore. And then he was like, you know what? Actually, I still kind of do. So I'm just going to go hop on over into Fairyland. And then I did not think that Julian and Christina and Emma would all go with them. But they did. And this is after the um, Centurions had all come and, like, invaded the Institute pretty much. And they had everybody, like, doing their laundry and cooking for them. And I'm like, what kind of warriors are you? It was just, it was all crap, basically, is what it was. Kieran's being, um, tortured even more than he already had, and Julian comes up with this, like, insane plan to kidnap the king of the Ancelis court's son, like, his favorite son, and just, like, calmly puts a knife to his throat? Julian is not to be messed with, and I feel like we are going to see, kind of, how dark he can really get in the next book, which I'm actually very excited about because these gray characters are like right up my alley. So to get into the fairy courts, they had to, this editing is going to be all over the place. So to get into fairy, they had to like give something to the door person. Like it was like a hotel doorman of fairyland. And so to get in, they had to give him something and then he kind of motivated them. So like, for example, Julian's was if you get in, you will find someone that knows how to break the parapetite bond. And then Christina was, if you get in, you'll find how to break the cold piece. And Emma's was, you'll see someone that you've been wanting to see for a very long time. And I don't actually know if they ever said Mark's. That's real messed up. I want to know what Mark's was. So anyways, Emma goes and she has to like fight to the battle to get Kieran. And then the person that she's fighting the whole time turns out to be her dad. But, like, not really her dad, but still the shock of seeing your dad on the ground with a sword to his throat that you're holding. It's, you know? Side note, we didn't see Tessa or Jim in this book, and, like, while I understand, I'm also very sad about it. And then, while Julian and Christina and Mark and Emma are all, like, fighting off in Fairyland, and Julian's talking to the Seely Queen, and Mark's meeting his aunt, or... I I don't know. Malcolm comes with a ton of seed demons and attacks the Institute. Like, he can't get in, obviously, but the Centurions are there, and Malcolm's like, oh yeah, by the way, not dead, which, like, did anybody ever really believe that he was dead? 
no but he comes and it's still like oh my god Malcolm Fade's alive and he's like I want what I always want I want Blackthorn blood so Arthur sacrifices himself and goes to where Malcolm is holding Annabelle and Arthur's dead Arthur is dead now I know that he wasn't like a main character or anything but he still had a very vital role in the storyline as like who Julian not despised, but just like the reason that Julian had to grow up at such a young age is because of Arthur, and now he's gone. And <sighs> Julian, man, he hurts my heart. And so Arthur goes, and then Annabelle is risen, and then Annabelle wakes up and immediately kills Malcolm. Like, that's just her first instinct. Is he like, you know what? I was perfectly content being dead, and you have ruined that for me for your own selfish reasons. And so she just stabs him to death, and he lets her, and everybody's like, oh, that's what true love is. And I'm like, <laughs> That's not healthy. Okay. And so while all this is happening, Julian is in the Seelie court watching it through like a scrying bowl with the Seelie queen. And she's like, if you get me that black book that Annabelle has that Malcolm used to raise her, I will tell you as much as I know about the Parabatai bond being able to be broken. And like, I understand Julian's motivation using that, but she never said that she actually knew how to. She just was like, I know that there's a way and I'll tell you what I know. I think Julian is just too stubborn and determined to let the smallest bit of information go free. And so he did it. And so he's like, yeah, sure, yippee ki -yay. I'll go ahead and get that black volume for you. Diana had portaled all of the Blackthorns plus Kit to London for safety reasons because Malcolm was like, well, if you don't do this, I'll let sea demons attack the mortals. And everybody was like, no, that's our job as shadow hunters to protect the mortals. It's kind of an overplayed gig at this point. Okay, so Kit is like not really a shadow hunter now, but he's been living at the Institute this whole time. And I love him because like, it's like the sarcasm of the Herondales just gets passed on through the times. One thing that I am really confused about though, like I know that genetics and like dominant and recessive genes and all of that, but Will Herondale was brunette. Okay, right? I'm not making that up. He was brunette, and yet Jace is super blonde, and then I pictured Kit brunette, but apparently Kit is super blonde, because everybody's like, wow, the resemblance is uncanny. You look like a real Herondale. And then Alex is like, wow, you look just like Jace. You got that Herondale look. And I'm like, from my point of view, William was the first, like, Herondale that we really got to know, and he was brunette. And this is, like, not related to the storyline at all, but I'm still really thrown off by it, because I feel like the Herondales are brunette. I know that Jace is blonde, but I pictured Kit brunette for some reason. I, I can't be the only one that pictured him as a brunette. I, okay, that's completely unrelated. But the sarcasm of the Herondales gets passed on through the generations, and I really like that Kit's kind of having this battle between, like, I really don't want to be a Herondale, but also, like, I really like Ty, and I want to protect him at all costs, and I really relate to that, because I too want to protect Ty at all costs. And I feel like we didn't get enough of Drew in this book. I know that, I feel like something's gonna happen with Drew in the next book, because she had this storyline with Jamie, who, by the way, came back, Diego's brother. I don't trust him or Diego. I don't know who to trust. I don't trust one of them. Diego and Christina had gotten back together. Then the Centurions came and there was this girl named Zara and he was like, oh yeah, my fiance. What? Christina does not deserve that. You do not deserve Christina. I'm real protective over her. She's just like the living embodiment of looks like a cinnamon roll and is actually a cinnamon roll, but like can also actually kill you if she really wanted to. And also at the beginning, Mark and Emma are, pre are pretending to date, but like... <laughs> Oh my goodness, Julian is so wrapped up in, like, love and jealousy that he cannot tell how fake it is coming off. I know that they did their best, but Emma and Mark are not the best liars. And even reading it, I was like, I <laughs> this is not believable, babes. You're not doing it. And while they're in Fairyland, Christina and Mark get bound together by this, like, binding room or something around their wrist with red ribbons from some, like, fairy dancing party. And if they get too far apart, it starts to, like, burn and cut into their skin and just bleed, you know, as cuts do. Christina starts to go in and she, like, passes out because of her wrist. And so she has to go back to the Institute, which is hilarious because Julian was wanting Christina to be a buffer between him and Emma. And then she has to leave and it's just iconic. And I'm like, you know what is coming? Some great moments between Emma and Julian are coming. The seven riders of the Unseely Court are released and they're like these immortal, deadly warrior being people that ro ride on like mist horses. I don't know. And they come and they're supposed to be completely unkillable. You can't kill these guys. 
That's the definition of un unkillable. Okay, so Emma kills one because he's attacking Julian and she has Cortana and Cortana is this like magical sword or something that was created by like the Wayland Smith himself and she kills one and then everybody flips out because you can't kill these guys. So that was never explained at all. I know that it's Cortana, but I feel like there's some deeper explanation to it. And then also they burn down a stone building. Emma and Julian burn down a stone building building. They go back and they like, have like a conversation about their emotions and I'm like, yes, communication. Let's just get this trip rolling because I, de I despise the lack of communication in a lot of like romantic relationships in books and I know that a lot of this book has been them not communicating, but they do in instances and it's great and wonderful and inspiring. And so Emma like just straight out the bat, she's like, you love me still? And Julian's like, <laughs> what? I, I do what now? No, I don't. Um, but he does and uh, he can't deny it. No one can deny it. It's very obvious. I'm sorry, Julian. And so they have this big conversation and they're like, wait, you still love me? Wait, you still love me? Wait, you didn't love Mark? Wait, you didn't love that one fairy girl that you kissed? And he was like, no, she was a shapeshifter and she looked like you. And Emma's like, oh, and Julian's like, Oh, and then Emma runs off and that's when they fight the battle and then she saves Julian because he's Julian and who doesn't want to save Julian? Fighting off seven deadly immortal warriors completely by herself. It why do we keep meeting like this? So everybody goes to Idris, which is where Diana has been this entire time trying to convince um, Aline's mom to bring Helen and Aline home and so they can testify in front of the council as well. And speaking of Diana, I'm... I'm so happy. I was just like smiling during this entire scene. So Gwen had been pursuing Diana and he was just like, you're really pretty and you're brave and you're smart and I'm just kind of really like into you. And it was so, everything that he said was very formal, but like what he was saying, if you got down to it, is just very juvenile. And I was very happy. I was like, how many times can I say the word very? And so the secret that Diana had been keeping, the reason that she can't take over the Institute is because she's transgender. So the council is very ignorant and bigoted and narrow-minded on their social views. But the best part about the whole scene is that Cassandra Clare didn't beat around the bush whatsoever. So Diana had gone off at a battle with Katarina Loss and her sister so when she was David, but she identified as Diana, and her sister Aria passed away during the battle. And then Katarina um, took her to a mundane hospital and let her do the mundane medical procedures for becoming the gender that she identified as and as who she is. So she couldn't let anybody know that she'd use mundane medical technology, but then the Dark War came and she was like, I can't I want to be a shadow hunter. I can't be a mundane anymore. And so she goes and she fought in the dark war. And then Gwen, without any hesitation, is like, I still really want to get to know you. I still want to be with you. It does not affect my feelings towards you at all. And it was just, oh man, the representation was incredible because there's so few transgender, actually, I don't think there's a single transgender character in any of the books on my shelf. And so I, I don't know. I just, I'm really happy about it, and I'm happy that the representation is there, and I hope that it gives inspiration to anybody that may be feeling the same way, and I know that it's obviously not the same situation for everyone, but I hope that it helps, and it, I don't know, it felt very, very important. The politics of this book hit just, like, a little bit too close to home. It was just very realistic to the politics going on in the world, or at least America, right now. I know that it's in other places too, but my knowledge is primarily on American politics for obvious reasons. Annabelle has to hold the mortal sword because Zara has taken credit for killing Malcolm, and Zara apparently has been taking credit for like all of the major battles that she has been in, and her stupid little like clique of mean girls has backed her up this entire time, and I'm like, you are all weak. Step up to her. She's lame and I hate her. Annabelle has to hold the mortal sword. She says that she kills Malcolm. Everybody gets super mad, and there's this group called the Cohort, which is basically like the Trump supporters of the console. They hate downworlders, they hate the relationship that Ma like Alec and Magnus have because they hate that alliance, they think that they have to go back to the golden age, make America great again. The shadow hunters being in charge and the downworlders are listening to them, which is something that never happened. What happened was the downworlders were being attacked and tortured at any chance the shadow hunters got. And it's just, there was never a golden age for the cohort to go back to. And that's what they're picturing and it just did not exist. They start like throwing bottles and stuff at Annabelle and Annabelle just freaks out, something snaps in her head, she finally goes insane because she's this person that's been dead for like 200 years and was just brought back to life 
And she takes the mortal sword and she stabs Robert Lightwood, who's the Inquisitor, and Alec's father. And Alex is back with Magnus, who has, like, passed out. And apparently all of the warlocks are, like, going, are, they're sick. And so Tessa's sick. And they mention, like, Jim trying to take care of Tessa, but nobody can figure out why all of the warlocks are sick. And it's not explained. And I need to know why all the warlocks are sick. Anyways, so Alec goes, and then Kit stays with Magnus, and Kieran's there too, and then Christina's like, Diego, I need help, and Diego's like, okay, what do you need? And Diego goes and takes Kieran to the Scholomance, which is the school for the Centurions, and <laughs> Magnus never wakes up. It's the end of the book. Magnus hasn't woken up. What's going on? I'm not okay. And next, um, Livy dies? Um... Emma starts fighting Annabelle, and Livy and Ty are all running into, like, this battle that has begun between all of the Shadow Hunters, and it's just absolute chaos, and, and, I can't, Emma goes to fight Annabelle, and she uses Cortana against the Mortal Sword, and the Mortal Sword just shatters. What? <laughs> the Mortal Sword is not something that should be able to shatter, and yet Cortana does it. I, that's also not explained. You see how I mean? Like, this is a big setup for the next book. Annabelle leaps over, and she uses some shard or something, and stabs Livy in the heart. Oh, okay, so Livy was older than Ty by, like, a couple of minutes, and she took on the role of being the mature one, being the one that has to be in charge when Julian was away, and she was like, well, I'm older than a couple of minutes, so Julian did it because he was the oldest, and so now I'm the oldest, and it's my responsibility. And so he's, she, like, took on that weight on her shoulders whenever Julian was away to take care of everybody, and Ty had just decided to become Parabatai with her, and it's something that she had wanted for so long, and she's never gonna get it, and Julian just lost, like, one of the people that he loves most in life, and I feel like this is really gonna be the trigger that takes him into, like, the dark ages of Julian. Livia didn't deserve to die. I know that Cassandra Clare said that not all the Blackthorns were gonna make it out, but I still, I don't know, I still was really shocked. I still, like, had to take a second. It's like a full circle because Emma lays down with Cortana and just hugs her and cries. One last thing, so Annabelle gets away. Emma goes to stab her and there's like this cloud of smoke and she just dissolves and disappears and I'm like 99% sure it was the Unseelie King and he's gonna like use her against everybody. I don't know. But a war is coming with the fairies. That's obvious. That's probably gonna be the basis of the next book. And I'm heartbroken. So th th there's really not much nothing else much to it. I can't form words anymore. Crap's gonna go down in the next book, and I'm not prepared. Halfway through reading this book, I was like, oh yeah, I got Lord of Shadows. Yeah, next book to Lady Midnight. And then I was like, wait a second, crap, that means there's only one book left. And I had trouble not focusing on that fact for a little while in the, during the middle. The thing with this book is that there was a lot of plot points individually, but there wasn't a big story arc like in Lady Midnight. Um, like, Lady Midnight, they had one goal, and they were all going towards that goal, but with this one, there was, like, a bunch of little things that happened, so I definitely forgot some things. I would love to talk about things that I forgot, get some information, because we all remember different things. So that's really all I have to say. I can't say any more without thinking about Livy, so... I hope you enjoyed the video for today. I hope that you have a wonderful day or night or whatever time it is, wherever you are, and thank you for watching.